What's coming up is free. There's a whole world of even better stuff for our Patreon supporters. Go to patreon.com slash word in your ear to see how you can join them. Welcome, welcome to uh, another edition of Word in Your Attic, and to a man who was uh, the head of the production company that made the day to day, and Alan Partridge, and who's later the controller of, of BBC One and, and ITV. But these glowing achievements pale into insignificance <laughs> when you notice that he was wallpapered his shed with old uh, back numbers of the Melody Maker. He's lagged his <laughs> shed with he old. Lagged. <laughs> It's true. It's, it's true. a great Peter Fincher. Peter, welcome. So look, this is fantastic. So when you're sitting there, are you? Well, I don't know what era these papers are. Is this kind of Zep Quo heaped at all, or is this crispy ambulance? You know, album review, <laughs> seat base twenty seven. Okay, so it's the early seventies, and we all right, were right. A family. I was I was one of five kids, and we were all told we were allowed one subscription yeah. a week to whatever might be our interest. So you know, yeah. it was one of my brothers. He, he might have he might have subscribed to Cricket Weekly or something because that's this kind of thing, but music yeah, yeah. was my thing. So I subscribed variously because I had kind of changing allegiances to Melody Maker, New Musical Express, and sometimes Sounds. And basically, when I was building this shed about ten years ago, I had boxes in my attic, uh, which obviously you, you know because I'm not in the attic, which is your video cast name but I did have boxes in my attic of my yeah. old because I never got rid of them I couldn't bear them to get rid of them so all I did was chuck them to a builder one day who was building the shed he was a Polish guy so he can't have had the shared cultural history at all and I said line the ceiling of the shed with with pages of this and I've got to say he did really well it's fantastic out, when people come I'll, I'll give you a little walk around yeah when people come into this shed they end up with a sore neck because the only it's thing reading the enemy is so is, brilliant. Exactly. So I don't know if this is going to work, but I'm. Going so to isn't it very distracting gonna, when I'm you're sitting walk, there I'm that you're going backwards? Oh I'll yeah, go, yeah. I'll walk slowly backwards and see what you see. Oh, uh, that's, that's fantastic. I, I've got to warn you: there is one serious faux pas. There's a full page ad somewhere for a Gary Glitter tour. Oh, they, so, that's fine. So we, we draw no, a we understand. That, that's that's Ray Davis on the cover of the yeah. movie making. Just Hang went on, past. I can go back. I can there keep he is. Around. Yeah. I remember yeah. moving Ray around. David. Yes. So this yeah. this place is me because the era is you know my teenage years when I was kind of into all this kind of stuff. Brian Ferry. Oh God, Brian, I remember that Brian, Brian Ferry cover. There's a, there's sounds you see. There's yeah Slade yeah yeah. Is that Dave sounds. Hill Slade on the in flame. They were a bit more. <laughs> there's the God, there's Gary Glitter. Let's move past that. Let's move past that. But. You know, there's quite a lot of classy stuff there. There's Ravi Shankar. Ravi Shankar. Advert for sharks. That's fantastic. Oh, TV, the Bolan. Bolan backtracks. Backtracks, stuff like that. Hang on. So isn't it very, isn't it very you know, dis, dis, you're distracting when you're sitting there trying to write and you're looking up at the ceiling and suddenly there's Rory Gallagher live yeah, yeah, yeah. at uh, De Montfort some, Hall, Leicester. Lennon, uh, Lennon jams with Dylan, that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. Dylan jams with Elton, that is. Thin Lizzie. Well, it is, but it's nice, isn't it? No, it's um, really good. I can't so just I say it's, it's very, it's very, it's very nice. On, on, copies for it. on yeah. behalf of the people who used to scribble for these papers, yeah, who always used to be told, "Oh, it's tomorrow's fish and chip paper." We could have said, "Yeah, not, yeah, yeah, not true, not true." Tomorrow's wallpaper. In fifty years' time true. or whatever, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, some bloke will be lagging his garden shed with. Um, you know, that's an it. exact parallel of what my mum said about pop music generally. She said, "It's here today, gone tomorrow. It won't last. People will have forgotten the Beatles. I don't know why you're interested in them." You know, and that was, at, but that was a normal thing to say. In Completely, the yeah. Maybe a bit less by the seventies. Um, the idea of the ephemeral nature of it, and yet here we are, and we still listen. Because my career is, you know, basically in television, and I always say this to people in television. You know, let's not get too excited about what we do. Mostly a programme we made 10 years ago isn't going to be watched at all unless it's a real classic. And certainly stuff, some go, you're not going to watch programmes made in the 60s. Yeah. Most of them are ephemera. But mu albums, great music from the 60s and the 70s, sounds as good today as it did then. It's timeless and, and uh, you know, all the cliches about soundtrack of our lives. It's true. 
So, so can we yeah. transport you back to where we uh, traditionally start with these ventures, sure. which is which is the 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 first? Can you remember what the record playing equipment was in the yeah, family home? Set. Yeah, yeah, it was a Dan set, and it was had a, a lid, and you lifted it up, and yeah. then it had an arm, and you could you could line up um, uh, yeah. singles like a stack of pancakes yeah. and listen to them as they dropped, and the needle yeah. landed on them. Did, and, they, and did they have a carrying a handle? So, so you have a carrying handle, so you could take it to a picnic. You used to have a handle. I, uh, yes, but I don't think we ever did. No, I nobody think, did, but no. they always had it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, if, and, and picnics, they always rained if you went for a picnic. Absolutely. So it Where are you going to get the power set. from anyway? Yeah, the great yeah, yeah, invention yeah. was the battery-operated uh, record player. Do you remember that, when you click back the arm? And you, I that, just, was I, that was I, portable, I do, but I don't anyway. think we had one. And they I were don't fantastic. Think we certainly, what was called hi-fi was an impossible dream. You know, this yeah, was yeah, what yeah. people who were, you know, had interest in this sort of thing. My parents wouldn't have thought it was worth investing in hi-fi. Um, we just had the bog standard dance set and, and mainly singles. I mean, albums, yeah. you had to save up you know, a lot of pocket money to buy an album. You had to really think about it. And I've, no. I've seen you cover this in, in you, you know, in your show before. By the time I bought an album, I had almost memorised the credits. Oh, yeah, and, and, Oh, you know, absolutely. I'd, was, I'd been in, the, in the record store in Bromley High Street or whatever, and I'd looked at the sleeve for so yeah. long that I felt I knew the album before I'd ever paid it because it was a, it was a big investment of your pocket money to yeah. actually sort of splash out on an album. Yeah. So what was on that record player? Can you remember what was being played? Your, you know, parents' it, records and, and your first records. My parents' records would have been, would have been classical or, or whatever. It's much said that. So I thought that the first, this is, a, this is an example of false memory syndrome. I could have sworn that the first single I bought was Robin Hood, Robin Hood, Riding Through the Glen by Dick James, because it was on the telly. And I'd, I'd have been about four or five. But looking through my collection, knowing that I was going to talk to you about this, I discovered that it wasn't that. It was William Tell hey. by, hang on, what's he called? David, David Whitfield. Whitfield. Shaw he was a big Orchestra. name, David Whitfield. Yeah. yeah. I mean, also, I mean, the great thing about Dick James singing Robin Hood is that we all know he became the publisher of the Beatles. <laughs> I don't know who David Whitfield went up No, way, hey, David the Whitfield, I think, represented the UK in the Eurovision Song Contest on more than one occasion. I think, well, right. There you are. There you are. <laughs> I actually think William Tell's a better piece of music than Robin Hood. You know, it is the William Tell, uh, come away, come away with William Tell. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's Rossini, isn't it? You know, it's Rossini wrote the original. I mean, now, now you're showing off your classical <laughs> knowledge I mean, there, David. Surely I, it. I don't know. I don't know. Um, well, I'm I very impressed that, was, that you've still got it. That's very good. Yeah, that, that was probably a birthday present when I was four or whatever. I think the first... What's the first one you bought? Uh, well, we would go to uh, um, to the record shop in, in Bromley. I come from Beckenham. Um, and I've, I've again looking this through. I've found some quite early stones, like the last time, or all it's right. all over okay. now. Yeah. So I was born in '56. So this is a, you know, '64, '65. 65, I was about eight yeah. or nine. I was probably old enough to use my pocket money to buy a single. The yeah. first album I can remember is a very specific memory because I kind of persuaded my dad to buy me. A Hard Day's Night for my eighth birthday. Wow. Um, uh, and uh, I can't find it, which is a shame. Um, but I, I'm, that, I think, was the first album that I, um, that I ever owned. So no, nothing very unpredictable. It's, the Beatles, uh, uh, it's not so. a bad start, Hard it's Day's a Night. Uh, uh, very good fact, album. You could it's argue that life could have been a bit of a disappointment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's all <laughs> downhill after no, Hard Day's Night. Pretty much our favourite Beatles, Beatles, Beatles album. album. By Lennon McCartney with nothing, no contribution from George. Absolutely. Absolutely right. Yeah. It's the only, Mark and I were talking about this thing the other day. It is the only Lennon and McCartney album, isn't it? It is, yeah. yeah. It's the only, absolutely right. The others no, either have know. George you on it or they have know, covers. You know more than I do, but you, you was George standing in the wings saying, I've written some good songs. 
Um, and they, you know, we Probably see this in the, in the West, that being point. documentary, don't we? Well, didn't they have to do it at incredible speed? They'd, they'd done the yeah, they songs just, for the film and they just said, that we've got another side to film. So they were the pros that could just bang stuff I, out. I, 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 I think that, yeah, I think at that point, they were just really priding themselves on the fact that, hey, we're just like Tim Panelli. We can yeah, do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Put us but, under pressure and we'll respond, you know. But there's no filler on Hard Day's Night. There's oh, absolutely. Incredible. That's incredible. It's a brilliant record. It's a brilliant, a brilliant I think movie. The, the album, the, the Beatles album that there is, there is filler on, if you're being really honest, is Beatles for Sale. Yes, yes. Mr. Got Moonlight. Like four or five great originals. Kansas and City. And then they just knock out things that they've been playing for years. Yeah, yeah. 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 They've run out of steam. It, yeah. Yeah. So what yeah. else have you got? Dad, so the, the first one you bought kind of like with your own money, you were saying was probably... Would it be the hard days that you got for, for Christmas? I mean, what, what, what was the first one you bought yourself? Okay, so when I got... I'll, I'll take you over to my yeah. vinyl connection, which... Blimey, it's not as impressive as yours is, David, because, it, because you, you know, for the reasons I say, so I get to kind of vinyl land and by now, well, there's a, there's a moment in my life uh, which, which shapes everything, which is when I first heard Bob Dylan. And then, uh, but we're, we're jumping through a few years now. I'm 14 They're or 15 gone. years old. Yeah. And, and so I must have read something probably in The Melody Maker that made me think I need to, you know, go back through the Dylan catalogue. So then I start buying, right. you know, the classic Dylan albums that have been around for quite a year, for, for quite a while. So I think this is probably the first moment at which I realise you don't only have to buy new albums, you can actually go back into people's catalogues and buy their classic albums. Yeah. And, and frankly, I think I kind of bought them all. It was a hell of a... Um, I'm saying that now and I can't find them because I can only find the new one. I was one. so confused by John Wesley Harding when he came out because I thought that that was the band. I thought those people were, yes. the, were yes. the members of the group. <laughs> yes, but I became deeply fascinated. I'm determined to find an old Dylan album. All I seem to find is 70s Dylan albums at the moment. I was fascinated by the idea that at the point at which everybody else turned right, he sort of turned left and stripped out all the instrumentation and yes. went kind of folky yeah. and then went country. And I found that absolutely fascinating. And, and you know, so then, then from that point on, and probably for the rest of my life, it's sort of been Bob Dylan and the rest, which, you know, doesn't make me very original, but was certainly... Uh, oh, this is fascinating. Thing. So... So one of, the, one of the one of the absolute the low is, points. My my daughter, or my one of my kids, has nicked all my Dylan vinyl. There you I go. There you go. Okay, yeah, that's it. That's life in the twenty first century. Those. Yeah. Because yeah. here's the thing. You know, Spotify started this thing called Wrapped at the end of last year. So oh, I, the, the, the or, years where, where they basically yeah. tell you what your favourite artists are. Four, three. I've got four children. Three of my four children, Bob Dylan was in their top three. <laughs> Which you know, I don't know whether I should feel proud about that, or, or I don't know what I should feel about it. Um, but they've nicked my, they've nicked the vinyl. <laughs> well, it's the vinyl they want, isn't it? That's the thing. So, yeah, are you they, still they buying the? They pay a lot of money for vinyl. Oh. Um, where I, I'm, I'm a vinyl heretic. I, I basically am perfectly happy never to put a needle on a record again. Yeah. And and uh, um, you, you know, happy to listen to it at good quality streaming. But they love it. Kids yeah, love yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. So I kind of went down a, that route, but at, I was at a boarding school in Kent where you had a division, and it was a very tribal division between people who liked heavy music. <laughs> and they oh, were yeah, often we that. people who had, whose parents had bought them quite loud hi-fi systems. Oh, okay. And we were in these tiny bedrooms called cubies, cubicles, yeah. where there was no soundproofing at all. So if the bloke in the next QB had got a bigger hi-fi system because his parents, you know, could afford to buy it for him, then he would get into Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple and play it ludicrously loud. And then the others of us who liked music like Bob Dylan and Neil Young, we would cower... Um, yeah, yeah. You, you know, and and I and I was in that tribe, and the tribalism stayed so long that it, it wasn't for decades that I revisited it. I can remember vividly. Oh God, I don't know, maybe twenty years ago, I was in a in a in a branch of odd bins, and I heard a track by Led Zeppelin, and I asked the bloke, "Who's that by?" And he said, "Led Zeppelin." And I thought, "Oh shit, I've been wrong all along. They're very good indeed." 
And I then went back and revisited and... and but then you just uh, saw them as the enemy, presumably, didn't I you? Or at least the people enemy, play them, so, playing them. They yeah. were so loud. And I couldn't hear John yeah. Wesley Harding because they were playing Led Zeppelin Four or something. And, also, John Wesley Harding's not really a very good weapon if you want to kind of fight back <laughs> with volume. No, it's not. <laughs> That's not going to work, I, is it? I, I dreamed I saw St. Augustine. Will exactly. not defeat... I don't think purple. any Dylan quite wins the high five battle in the road <laughs> to my boarding school. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what's interesting though, and, and nowadays I find they're going to odd bins occasionally, and they're very often playing music in odd bins, and they're very yeah. often the kind of guys who used to work in record shops years yeah, ago. Yeah, very similar. <laughs> And now they're guys in their 50s and 60s or whatever working in odd bins. And they love the idea that they can go in there and they can play ZZ Top or whatever. Yeah, they can play whatever they want. They make their own playlists. And then somebody, somebody, a customer comes in, they'll go, oh, I know this or whatever. But if you think about it, choosing a bottle of wine is a bit like choosing a record in a record store. You're worried that the guy behind the counter will look at it and sneer and say, (laughs) oh, my God, the Pinot Noir, that's not very good. absolutely. That's so true. You know, you in a record store, you always felt a bit less cool than the people working there. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they were always desperate to recommend things, you know, yeah. show <laughs> off their, their immense snobbery. Absolutely. <laughs> right. So where was it you used to go and shop for records when you were when you were a youngster? Well, I was either in I come from Beckenham, so I was either in Beckenham or Bromley High Street, which both had a both had record stores. Were they or good when ones? I was at boarding I was at boarding school in a place called Tunbridge in Kent. Right. And 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 there was a record store there. And, and when you you know when you were, had some free time, uh, if you were into music, you would go down there. I just must have driven the record store mad because you would flick through these things, admiring the album covers, reading the lyrics or whatever, but you didn't have enough money to and then buy didn't them. them. I know. They were so doggy in. I, I, but also nobody in those days, and you know, trying to ascertain exactly when these things arrived, nobody had credit cards. So if you didn't oh. have the cash money God on no. you, God no. you, couldn't, yeah. you couldn't think, oh, yeah, I'll yeah, yeah. get that and I'll pay for it in three weeks or whatever. Yeah. It wasn't an option. And there wasn't really a mechanism for listening to an album oh, other no. than going into a record store and kind of, you know, sometimes they had little booths and they'd play you a track or two, but you quite but no, no felt you were out saying you're welcome. Did you then, have at boarding school? I'm intrigued by this. I've got friends who've been to boarding school and they had and they had this experience that when you came back from the Easter holidays or whatever or summer, people would come back with new records, absolutely. and they would always be come round to my room tonight. We're going to listen to whatever. Can you remember this? Did I that? can definitely remember that. And 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 also the world changed during term time. So I was at boarding school when I was about 12 at a school where they banned radio and music completely. It was thought to be, you know, uh, <laughs> everything that was corrupting the nation's youth. So Isn't I that would extraordinary go, now? God. I would go home in the holidays and found that the Beatles had grown moustaches and I hadn't even known. No. I hadn't even known and that they'd gone all hippie-ish or that Jimmy, Jimi Hendrix had died, which you wouldn't know at school because there was no mechanism for finding these things out. So there are gaps in my kind of musical... Um, you, you, know, you know, I only got to hear Revolver much later in life when I could hear it because I must have been at school when it came out. Yeah, you yeah. weren't allowed to. So, yeah. yes, that's a, that's a strange... I mean, you know, because universal accessibility in music is something we've taken for granted for quite a long time now, it wasn't always thus, was it? Well, it was, definitely not. If you're if you're at boarding school, does that mean that you got less of a chance to go out and see see bands, go to gigs? Because that's the general well, experience of people. That, that, that's school. absolutely you true. Can't do and I've that. got a, a bad record of nearly seeing gigs. So I'll get, give you some examples. So I had tickets to see Jimi Hendrix in the Chislehurst Caves, <laughs> and my mum wouldn't let me go because I wasn't old enough. So. Sorry, Mum, that was not, you know, that was awful. And then some years later, I went, this is really pathetic, I went to a concert, um, uh, a free concert in Hyde Park by Pink Floyd. Um, but I watched the Support Acts, which were the third ear band and the Edgar Broughton band. Yes. But then I lost my nerve because it was getting dark. And I thought, I, I don't like being in Hyde Park here. And I got on the train back to Beckenham and I missed Pink Floyd. You yeah, missed Pink Floyd. Oh, Tragic, God. isn't it? Tragic. On the other hand, a thing I did when I was at boarding school, which would have got me expelled without a doubt, with a friend of mine called Harrison, we left after Lights Out one night 
went, took the last train up to London, went to the Roundhouse and saw an all-night gig. And the, the top of the bill was Hawkwind. And then we got the first train back and we were back in our beds before breakfast and nobody ever found us out. Oh, and that was memorable, not only because of Hawkwind, that was the first time I ever saw a naked lady. Ah, oh, oh, yeah, Hawkwind. absolutely. I can't remember her name. Stasia. 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 There you go. I, I was probably about. You can't remember years. the. I can't remember the name of the first naked woman I saw. <laughs> Good God! Well, I did. Was see her the, in the bloody middle, world in the coming to? But even in the middle distance was quite exciting <laughs> at the age of fifteen. Oh dear! Um, and uh, but that was a crazy thing to do because I would have been expelled without without hesitation if I'd been. That, I love the idea that you sort of going down to breakfast the next morning smelling of you know patchouli oil. And marijuana. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, but I, yeah. I, I would see gigs. I, I, the, the Fairfield Holds Croydon was the place yeah. that we, that was, you know, that was exciting. And I'd go to see Mott the Hoople there, or yeah. I saw a King Crimson. And then I, can't, I mean, I can't remember which incarnation. I don't think any two gigs that King Crimson have ever played have had the same lineup. So <laughs> uh, I'm sure Robert Fripp was there. But other than that, I'm in the faintest idea. Actually, yeah. no, the at my school, one of the sort of hero figures to us was Bill Bruford, the drummer of oh, Yes and then yeah, yeah. because he'd been to my school. And that oh, felt well, like the go. faintest connection to the world of the glamorous world of rock and roll that we would all rather have been in than in a, a boarding school in Kent, you know. So, so was was Bill Bruford in the lineup of King Crimson that you saw? Do you know I ought to know that? Would it have been him or Ian Wallace, I'm guessing? That's I, I, so. I can't remember, but uh Oh, well, uh, they were no, good, King Crimson. Did. Oh, absolutely. And they still are. Still are. Still, are. It's still going. They're still fantastic. Have you seen that documentary? Yes. I haven't seen it yet. I've it's it. really, really good, I think. It's they, very they have a theory that, that Robert Fripp is one of the very few people who seems to have already achieved everything he set out to he's achieve. Won he's won rock and roll. Complete, he's, won. he's won rock and roll. He appears to be completely unbitter about anything. He's got no and, kind and of problem. everybody else who's ever been in King Crimson appears to have been in an abusive relationship with Robert Fripp yeah. that he's got the better of. Yes. He's got the better Pretty of. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I know, bizarre. Is that is remarkable. Is remarkable. What else you got there? Have you put? You got anything else? I uh, went then. So then I went to Cambridge, and I'm going to show you a really embarrassing photograph because I was in the Cambridge Footlights, and that kind oh, of. Right. Links Are you in the musical career. director? Weren't you? I was the musical director. That's exactly the point. So here's me. I mean, this is an embarrassing photo. Oh wow! But you can probably right. see it. I'm the one on the right with the stripy jacket. And okay. so there's Griffiths Jones there, Clive Anderson, Jimmy Mulville, Roy McGrath. That is my generation of folk who who were uh, kind of in the Cambridge Footlights. And yeah, and yeah, I was uh, the musical director of that. And, what did uh, that entail, musical director? Did you have to write stuff for it? Or you... Yes, yeah, I wrote quite a lot of uh, bits of incidental music here and there. Well, uh, you could say accompanying people. Who 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 can't sing? So that is a skill in itself. You know, yeah, in other words, right. if you're if you're accompanying somebody who's doing, let's say, a parody of a famous song, uh, yeah. and they can't keep time or sing, uh, it's more challenging than you, than you would think. Um, <laughs> and and I I did a bit of that, and then I was a musician during my twenties, kind of working in theatre. I never got into the rock and roll world. I wish I had. Then that fizzled out. And but and you were you were writing songs, weren't you? I wrote a lot of songs. Yeah. So I songs for who? Songs. Were you writing them specifically songs, for? I'm not, I'm not going to play any of those. I wrote a lot of songs for musicals that either got made or nearly got made. And, yeah. uh, um, uh, but it kind of fizzled out. And then where I next land on the map, which is where I met the two of you, but you're, you're not going to remember this, was that I was writing questions for Pop Quiz, um, <laughs> the, the BBC programme, and, and it was produced by a friend of mine called John Plowman, um, yeah. Yeah. who I still work with because in this very shed I do a, a podcast or I do a Radio 4 series for him called What's Funny About With Him. We co-presented. But I, but you were you were in the old grey whistle test. Um, this was another, I think there's a lot of examples in, my, in this in my life where I'm in proximity to people who are cooler than me. Because <laughs> let's be honest, Pop Quiz was not cool. It was presented by Mike Reed. Mike Reed. We can uh, remember it very well. It's produced exactly. by Mike Appleton, who did Whistle Test. It, yeah, exactly. Uh, but next door was the Elgrey Whistle Test, and you guys 
you know, you you met, you know, cool rock stars and put them on your show and all that kind of stuff. So I would probably have very happily have snuck next door and and joined your production team if anybody had offered me a, a role on it, but, but that but that never happened. So, was so what was your a, job? This, exactly? this was across the road from Television Centre, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, in a, it was in a building that, I'm pretty sure doesn't exist anymore. No, it doesn't. I noticed. No. It I turned into luxury flats or yes, something probably, now. Probably. Probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would come and hang out there. I'm like, the only question I can remember that uh, that got on the show, I think I had a few questions on the show. They paid me a fiver a question, something, was uh, name two number one singles by The Who. And I mean, any self respecting pop fan can see a trick question coming a mile off. The Who never had a number one. I was going to say, yeah. yeah. I well, you know one. that. I mean, so, I'm so Tom Robinson or, or uh, Tony oh. Handley of Spandau Ballet fell at that hurdle. Yeah, sure. spot, they said, oh, my generation or something. And <laughs> yeah. they, they'd have been wrong. They never got to number one. Well, so. What we remember about pop quizzes was one week when Mike Reed decided to wear a hairband. Do you remember that? He decided he was going to start a new fashion. He wore a hairband. Yeah, I think yeah. the producer took him aside afterwards and said, mate, lose the hairband. It's not working. I, I do remember a, an episode of Pop Quiz. I think it was a Christmas special that was Spandau Ballet versus Duran Duran. Oh, yeah, yes. yeah, it was. And, yeah, it was. and I can remember it because I'm roughly the same age as Spandau Ballet and Duran Duran. And I'm about... 27 by this point, and I'm writing questions for Pop Quiz for a fiver ago. That is not the peak of anybody's career. That feels, and I remember looking at these guys and thinking, sort of, where have I gone wrong? Because I would have swapped my life with theirs in an instant at that moment. Yeah. Because they just appeared to be young gods. Do you know what I mean? I mean, girls were, you know, they were, sort of, you know, they were seeing more stuff. sex than a policeman's torch at that point, <laughs> particular point where they <laughs> exactly and thinking they're good looking and they, they they've got you know they they they, they I mean that's not my music um, but they but they seem to have you know won the lottery they, of life. They, all get, they were kind of they they're still there, aren't they? Yeah. Really, all I these think they years have, later. I, when you see Martin Kemp, I feel the same way. Actually, he's still fabulous looking and yes. just seems to have absolutely kind of landed and, on and his he feet. He had an acting career. And I, in fact, funny enough, I used to have party when I was the director of television at ITV, I used to have talent parties in the garden right by this shed here. And I met Martin Kemp. And, and so the rules are reversed because I hate to say it, he was quite excited to meet the director of television at ITV. <laughs> I'm sure. He was in some ITV drama. And, and I thought, how weird, because t- however many years, 25 years ago, I gawped at you and, and uh, I've, I met Gary as well. And uh, I've gawped at you and thought, you know, how's it all gone so well for you guys? So um, <laughs> anyway, th- and then going on from Pop Quiz, there's a musical link, because you, you mentioned some of the things that I did in the 90s when I was running Talkback. But I, I created Nevermind the Buzzcocks, which in okay. a sense was the... Uh, follow up to pop quiz and yeah, yeah. yeah. the second answer to that are yeah uh, we'd made a show called they think it's all over which was a, a very successful sports quiz at the nick time. hancock nick hancock which yeah. rory mcgrath was yeah, in yeah. Who was yeah, in that yeah. photo and that really was a big bbc one show yeah. and then i went to the bbc in a very opportunistic way as you have to as an independent producer and said i can repeat the dose here i've got two ideas i've got an idea which uh uh, which was a general knowledge quiz, which is called Thick as a Plank. And I've got a, 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 uh, a music-based idea called Nevermind the Bollocks. And they commissioned pilots of both. And then Thick as a Plank got thrown in the bin, as things do. But they said, we want to do this one, but you can't call it Nevermind the Bollocks. <laughs> sure. so I'd sort of seen this coming a mile off, really. So I said, I'm not worried about that because I'm just going to call it B, never mind, never mind the B dash, 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 CKS. And um, uh, so they said, oh, well, we're going to have to talk to the Radio Times about yeah, this. Okay. I love the idea that we're talking about a world here where the Radio Times, uh, in a sense, dictated the, the you know, yeah, the commission yeah. policy or titles. So they went off to talk to the Radio Times and they came back and said, you cannot call it B dash, 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 CKS because our, our, our readers will work out that you mean bollocks. <laughs> but I had the trump card up my sleeve and said, in that case, we shall call it never mind the buzzcocks. Very good. That She's is a brilliant title. Called, it's still who is, who is the presenter of the, uh, of the pilot show then? It was Mark Lamar. Was Mark oh, Lamar. Right, okay. Mark Lamar, who was as hot as hot because he'd been on Channel 4 doing, I don't know, the tube type things or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and he was very, very funny. But, yeah. he was, but he wasn't comfortable in his skin, Mark Lamar. And, and, 
this happens with those shows, with those panel shows, even though they are in a way kind of a meal ticket to the guys in them. After a while, they think, but I can do so much more yes, than this. All I'm, I'm better. Yes, yeah. I'm better. And he, he was like that. And also Sean Hughes, who was originally in the lineup, they yeah. both eventually left thinking, I'm going to go on to more glorious things. Oh, beware. There's an old Hollywood saying, don't quit the hit. And the danger is that you go on to less glorious things. Because the amazing thing I was thinking about this only the other day is whenever I turn on the television, is never mind the buzzcocks, it's still on. It's, it's still there. there. I know. How, how? I, and I think, do you know, this are is they a, still making it? I, and I think, I'm, who it, it, the it, hell is watching it? It, it? it ran for 19 years on BBC. Then they rested it and then they brought it back on Sky. It's on Sky. But I, when I sold my company, Talk Back in 2000, Almost as an afterthought, they, there was a clause where they said they wanted to buy my intellectual property. And, Yours? And yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, because they were buying the company and uh. stuff, I said, oh, all right, you can have intellectual property. I should never have signed that clause or I would still be getting format fees. Yes. Never, I, I didn't, I, I, I worked with some colleagues who, you know, worked out the format with me. So I didn't know all of it, but it would have been a nice little learner, wouldn't it? And even still, these good. things would last for so many years. They rather like pop music in the sixties, television in the nineties. You didn't believe that what you were doing would still be on air or would resonate like things like Brass Eye and and the Day to Day. All these years later, you didn't think it was going to be like that. You thought, well, the the influence of those programs is huge, and Partridge know, is the one that's astonishing. Because Partridge still goes as feature films. You know, Alan Partridge know. appeared with Coldplay at Wembley Stadium not long ago. You know, yeah, I, could I, you I ever that. have imagined that? Way, thing is, Steve Coogan, he's now the right age. He's probably getting slightly too old for Partridge, but Partridge was, was always a man, you know, that he needed to be a disappointed man and you need to reach a certain stage in life to be that. So <laughs> so actually, yeah. I think Partridge is an extraordinary journey. I was only there and in the, involved in it in the early parts, but... I think it's the best comic character ever. Actually, I think. Do, I you, do, do, you, do you think? Uh, yeah, I think that's a fair, fair point. Um, do you think though that this stuff resonates so much nowadays because it was made in a different world? You know, it couldn't I'm not sure be. About it that. couldn't be. Could it be invented tomorrow? Maybe. I mean, there's, plenty, there's plenty of crap television in the nineties as well. So no, I know, but yeah. well, you sat down at a certain point. Yeah, and it was yeah. nine o'clock or whatever. You watched it. Whereas that kind of humour seems to me just has just disappeared into a million memes and you know million YouTube yeah. clips. I, I don't know. I don't know. I've, I'm I, by instinct very resistant to the idea that there were golden days and, and no, the, I know what you mean. About or, that. or rather, I'm I'm that in relation to television, partly because. I professionally needed to be because I ran channels for 10 years. So yeah. you can't say things ain't what they used to be if you're running BBC One or ITV. I'm much more like that in relation to music as I feel, you know, who cares what I think about music? So I think the best music was, you know, was made in the early 70s. If you would, wait, 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 haven't one of you written a book about this? I would say <laughs> 1970 to 1975, I would fight a battle if you like to say it's never been surpassed those but doesn't years. everybody doesn't what, everybody what, say that about yeah, the, the period one thing of you there. could say about without any contradiction you could scientifically prove it is that yes. and Danny Baker is a particular exponent of this argument more happened between 1970 and the arrival of punk than it ever happened before in popular music or will ever yeah. happen again and that's undoubtedly I, I, true honestly i've had this discussion with Danny Baker and uh, I'm on the same page. And of course, Danny's a great prog rock fan, which I'm also a great prog, prog rock fan. The reggae. But, I, but yeah. the irony of what you're saying is when punk came along, it came along to say music has got boring, lazy, <laughs> was tired. Not, yeah. It came along at the end of the most fertile yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. phase of music. I mean, what, what were they rebelling against? There was fantastic music around. Uh, but you know they they successfully said, "Don't listen to that. Listen to this." No, absolutely, but, very yeah. successful. And you could argue that that uh, you know that a lot of the people who were saying that you very rarely hear their records now. You know, I well, mean, and that's true of most punk. I mean, there is obviously it is. fantastic punk like the Clash or whatever. But a lot but of but most punk, of it seems so dated, doesn't it? It's so it narrow, terribly dated. Yeah. And and 
you know, there's plenty of music from the years leading up to it that is... Because you can't listen to it as a piece of music. You listen to it as a kind of statement, and the statement doesn't matter anymore, and therefore it doesn't seem to have any value, really. Yes, yes, exactly. exactly. Once you've robbed it, 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 you know, once you rob the immediacy of it, the context of it, yeah, yeah, yeah. is it still fantastic music? Well, you know, that some of it is, but and, and from the punk era came some fantastic bands kind of, you know, coming in, it's smuggled in under yeah. the punk banner, but that's yeah. a different thing. Um, but, but I, you know, I, so I, yeah, I do, I'm still a bit in the 70s. But, but also you have, you go back from music to television, you know, in the days, the, the, the 70s, and a lot of stuff came out, you had relatively few uh, ways to market. There were a few record yes. companies, so they controlled things. Yeah, yeah. You had one radio station, everybody listened to it. So something yeah. was exciting. Everybody agreed about it very, very quickly. You don't have that now, anyway. That that's gone. You know. So I was thinking about this this week. You know, the Oscars is is swept by what's it called? Every, everything, everywhere, all at once, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You know, I haven't met anybody who's seen it. Now, <laughs> you know, no. you know, wh- whatever won the Oscar in 1974, yeah, everybody yeah. would have seen it because yeah. everybody who went to the pictures would have seen it. The Sting. Yeah, well, whatever it was, you know. Yeah, yeah. And no, uh, I, I, I know what you mean. And I think that, I mean, the role of music on television, when I became the uh, controller of BBC One uh, in 2005, uh, um, I sort of, I, I thought, I wonder how I can push the limits of my power here. So I went to a guy you almost certainly know called Mark Cooper, who was the head of music yeah, 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 yeah. at BBC at the time. Well. I said, Mark, I'm thinking we might commission a, a thing called something like the BBC One Concerts or the BBC One Sessions um, and, you know, put it out the slot after the news at 10.30 after the news. Can we do that? And he said, if you want to do it, of course we can do it. You're the controller. So we did it. And we just literally, he said, who do you want? And I said, well, I'd like to meet some of my, my childhood icons. <laughs> so, we, you know, we got Paul Simon came and did a, a, a show in that um, uh, um so that, that church in Old Street, I think. Everybody oh, yeah, was there. Works. The only yeah. person who wouldn't do the church in Old Street was Cat Stevens, Yusuf, because he, he's a Muslim, so he's not going to do yeah, the yeah. church. So we went somewhere else. Then. And, and we did Amy Winehouse. We did all sorts of, uh, who was still quite new talent at the time. Literally, just because we could, we did it. Yeah. There was, in other words, there was no answerability to anybody. The ratings were okay. Um, but the, the promotional... The promotional power of a BBC One slot got some very big artists out. Absolutely. And did it and things like that. And I remember thinking, this is a bizarre world we're in when you can just do that because you fancy it. And by the time... But I there was no fa- fear people, of failure, though, was there? The whole idea now, no feel, failure, people are terrified no of having their name attached to the thing yeah. that doesn't work, you know. There's no ratings pressure at, at after yeah. the news. So, so if you got a million viewers or whatever, that was perfectly acceptable. And you could you could always, and this was a thing at the BBC anyway, you could say, well, this is a commitment to the arts because by now, um, you, you know, you could say music was the arts, if you like. Well, maybe that was the true when you were doing Old Grey Whistle Test. But in other words, we moved a long way from from my parents' attitude to the top of the pops, if you like. Yeah. So I could do that. But then when I got to ITV, um, music had a different role and one that I found more depressing because it essentially existed in the context of the X Factor and the kind of world of Simon yeah, Cowell. Yeah, yeah. And, and I was, you know, I understood this is great television and, you know, huge audiences watched it. But I always felt rather depressed about it as a music fan. There was no in a sense, role to, for music in it. And I can remember once going round to, to, to Simon's office and, you know, I don't know what, The X Factor had just finished another incredibly successful um, incredibly successful season and got 12, 13, 14 million viewers. And he said, ah, oh, Peter, glad you're here. I want to play you the winner's single. Um, the winner had been Alexandra Burke, by the way, the singer. And, and they had to put a single out within days to get the beat, Christmas number one. He said, you're going to be familiar with the song, Peter, but you believe me, you'll never have heard it done like this. So I, I wonder what's coming up. And uh, he would play things at ear-splitting volume. And it was Alexandra Burke singing Hallelujah by <coughs> Leonard Cohen. And it's true. I'd never heard never. of it <laughs> like this. She fucking murdered it. It was absolutely <laughs> appalling on every level musically but he knew what he was doing and it was a number one hit 
And, and you, you know, I thought, I wonder whether the audience are actually listening to the lyrics of this. I've got the faintest idea of what this song is about. But you, 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 you could see music there turned into, I'm not saying he's the first to do this, turned into a commodity where, he, he, you know, he, I, I, I once, in, I'm a bit wary of telling stories about Simon Cowell, lest somebody else should see this and tell other people, but I once interviewed him on a, on a, on a platform. I got very well with Simon Cowell. I'm going to speak well of him. He's a very charming guy and all that. And I, and, and there was a Q&A with an audience. And the, the first question was, what's your favourite album of all time, Simon? And he was like a rabbit in the headlights because I don't think he's got a favourite album of all time. No. And after quite a long pause, he said, Beatles Greatest Dark Hits. Side of, <laughs> Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd. And I honestly think it was the only album he could think of. <laughs> and, he, and, he knew, and he knew made a respectable answer, if you might. Yeah, yeah. 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 Because this is a world, you know, music to me, I'm kind of glad in a way that I haven't had a career in music because I've been able to be a fan of music and remain a fan of music. And, but in television, you also find music where it's a kind of commodity and it's nothing to do with yeah, good music yeah. at all. So the, the, the way we traditionally wind up these conversations, which have been fascinating, actually, is ask people to tell us what is the greatest record ever made? Do you know, know the answer to that? Do you know I the know. answer? We're still very keen to, to, to learn. Because we've searched we, high, we've searched yeah. low. And we haven't found an answer yet. I know. We still haven't and found what you, we're looking for. Go on. The trouble is, I haven't got a very original answer, but my favourite artist is Bob Dylan. Right. And if you're my generation, so you caught up with the 60s retrospectively, and I used to get together with a group of people to do nights where th th this was with people like Douglas Adams and Richard Curtis all big Dylan fans. You may have had them on yeah. this very, but well, yeah. not Douglas, because he's not with us no, anymore. No. But you may have had them on your on your video cast. But uh, we used to get together to do a sort of countdown to the best ever Dylan track. And always in our top tens, uh, Blood on the Tracks would be quite heavily oh. heavily featured. The reason being, we're of a generation to have bought it as adults and understood it as an adults, whereas Blonde on Blonde or whatever, we, we, you know, we, we, were, we were kids when that came out. We caught up with it late, later. So I don't think I can do better than saying Blood on the Tracks by Bob okay. Dylan okay. is the best album ever made because I sort of think it it's is. It's got to be it quiet is. now, is it, Dave? <laughs> it's, no, that's just me. It's no, my it's blind good. spot. It's my blind spot album. No, it's, it's mine too. I understand the blind spot. And, you're, and, and also there's a debate among Dylan fans as to whether he should have put out the original version of it. Which somebody sent in. me the other day. I've been listening to the original version and it's distinctly better. Well, uh, you're wrong. Because, the, <laughs> but a lot of Dylan fans, and I know you've had Lucas Hare and Kerry Shale who are yeah, friends of yeah, mine and I've been yeah. on their <laughs> podcast talking about Dylan and everything. But the, the thing is, his brother said, it all sounds a bit the same, Bob. You need to re-record some of these tracks with a band. And I think he was right. And I think great though those recordings are, they don't have enough variety in them. And so I stand by the re-recording of them in Canada, uh, where you okay. get more electrified. But I, I mean, we are disappearing into the more... I was going to say, this is precisely what these, these podcasts are about. It's is, is three, three old boys I, arguing about which is better, the original... <laughs> I think well, we, I want to, I, I want to know Peter's, say, I want to know Peter's a view on the, uh, on the, we were talking about the other day, the Rolling Stone have just published a very interesting uh, major feature called Wretched Records by Really Great Artists. It's 50, you know, 50 Okay, spot. yeah. It's a really good idea. And they've got one Bob Dylan record on there. Which they is say that, Well, which you can guess. It's the one that Bob Dylan made you think that is genuinely horrible. It's without, we, without we think we know the answer to this. <laughs> it is an album. It's either it's either um, knocked out, loaded, or down in the groove. It's down that's absolutely groove. right. They say it's down in the, down in the groove, and, and actually, down in the groove is considerably worse than knocked out, loaded. It is considerably. Yeah, it worse. is. He's got no decent tracks, and I think saved is in there too as a possibility. No, saved, no, no. Saved, 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 saved is not a great album, but there's some good tracks yeah. on saved. There's some good songs on saved that are better in the in the live versions on the recent Trouble No More. I also must put in a word for the very recent Fragments, which is the yeah. bootleg version of Time Out of Mind. It's a revelation and has had me revisiting Time Out of Mind uh, uh, with fresh ears. It's a great, um, great thing that they did there. Um, 
to re oh, you don't want to hear any more of this, do you? This no, is, you're, you're we do. This is we can listen to this all day. <laughs> That's the trouble. <laughs> Bob Dylan. We're very, very happy. To be it was a brilliant. You're talking about Richard Curtis. Richard Curtis uh, and Kerry, in fact, did, uh, did Kerry did a fantastic radio play, didn't they? About, uh, well, no, that's written by my friend John Cantor, who I would recommend, that's right. recommend you to have on the video cast. There's John's in my little group of Dylan Dylan fans, and he wrote it. And and I hate to say it, Richard Curtis is playing me to a point. Oh, this, this is what yeah. John says. Because I had a dinner with Jeff Rosen, Bob's manager, because he's a friend of mine, and he was over in London, and he invited me out to dinner. And I've got a feeling that I teased John by saying, I'm having dinner with Jeff, but Bob might turn Bob up. Bob might turn up. Absolutely I, wasn't the case at I all. I thought that was so classic, because that's what the John whole thing is basically out. about, is will Bob Dylan appear? You know? Yeah, John turned this into that radio play, the one you're talking about. That's exactly about. the kind of thing a manager would say. Richard, who isn't even an actor, to play to play the character. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can tell we're disappearing into an incestuous little group of... It's, uh, this is becoming, you know, almost embarrassing, I think. It's but, what the internet's here, here for. It is. It's perfectly <laughs> legit. Lovely yeah, to yeah. talk we're, to we're, you. We're among consenting adults. With Absolutely. No uh, absolutely. Any, anybody who's still with us deserves all they get. <laughs> That's modern <laughs> television. <laughs>